American unions have not had a heck of a lot of experience uh, in attempting to deal with struggles on an international level. Um, or internationalism at its best in the history of the American labor movement usually took the form that anybody that comes here is welcome into our organization. And most of the times it wasn't at its best, uh, but that was the best. Um, the sense of common cause with uh, workers elsewhere um, is much more uncommon and the question came up about the AFL's international role. We'll see how distorted that could be. But let me start with the industrial workers of the world uh, since the question came up about them. Um, the industrial workers of the world, as most of you know, uh, came into existence in 1905 really had its heyday between then and the middle of the 1920s. Uh, still around. He said, you remember? Okay, very <laughs> definitely still around. Uh, 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 with us at this point. Um, but um, the IWW, first of all, in its early days, largely treated the whole notion of race as a kind of bourgeois trick. Um, the, uh, the capitalists have come up with this notion to separate us uh, out one from another. And the important thing is who's a worker and who's not a worker. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so uh, all workers should join together in a common cause. Out of this there was really um, not much in the early days not much careful or sophisticated thinking about nationalism or anti-imperialism uh, and so forth, but there was complete defiance of the standards of white supremacy that dominated uh, the United States of America. They just said, this is garbage, you know, uh, we want nothing to do with it. Uh, and um, there the question sort of began and ended uh, for uh, their purposes. This became particularly important in some of their organizing in the South uh, because in the period when they were strong, 90% um, of African Americans uh, lived in the South. And moreover, in the Southwest, um, there were very important uh, ties with Mexican American workers and involvement with them, and involvement with the Mexican Revolution, which is right in exactly the same time. You know, um, uh, coming to fruition um, uh, 1912 and thereafter. Um, but the, um, the IWW had one important branch called the Brotherhood of Timber Workers uh, in uh, Louisiana that was almost half and half, uh, white and black. Uh, and it grew out of the very local struggles of workers in the Louisiana and East Texas uh, timber areas. Um, they absolutely um, defied local customs of uh, segregation in their everyday work and met with ferocious repression um, uh, as a result. Any union, by the way, that went into those timber fields was going to meet with uh, ferocious repression, American labor history, a name like Bogalusa makes you start to tremble and blood on the streets uh, right off the bat and the kind of uh, assaults of vigilantes and national guards and so forth uh, that they uh, uh, came to face. Um, what was most noteworthy of all perhaps is that coming out of the 19th century, almost all labor organizations in the United States would have nothing to do with immigrants from China. Mm -hmm. Indeed, the Chinese exclusion uh, becomes a major demand of the Knights of Labor, of the American Federation of Labor, uh, not only Chinese, but Japanese too, Asians in general. Um, there was uh, a, uh, a strike in Oxnard, California. Any Californians? Around. Okay, you know Oxnard, I hope. Um, 
it was a place like Bogalusa. You start to tremble when you when you hear of Oxnard. Um, but in Oxnard, California, there was a big strike waged jointly by Mexican workers and Japanese workers, about 50-50. They applied for a charter to the AFL uh, in 1910, uh, and um, the charter, the application was rejected uh, with a letter, personal letter from Samuel Gobber is coming back. He said, the Mexicans are welcome, but no Japanese. Uh, and the Mexicans uh, said, they're our comrades. What the hell? How can we form a union without them? Uh, you know, and, well, then, then keep your charter, uh, in effect, was the end of it. Uh, and that was the beginning end. Well, the IWW moved there, Mexican, Chinese, Japanese, you know, your worker. Uh, this is what um, uh, matters as far as we're concerned. And there was the, the most um, dramatic defiance uh, of the um, uh, white supremacist legacies, I think, uh, of the time. Um, so in effect, um, you know, the, I would say that um, they're the first organization on the American left um, that really tried to take racism head on and simply say we'll have no part of it. The, the record of the Socialist Party the same, is a very mixed one. Uh, you can find everything in it, everything from open racist to um, ardent egalitarian. And in, in Oklahoma, the record was terrific. Uh, Mississippi, it was lousy, uh, you know, uh, all depending on, on where you're looking. But the IWW, as I say, is the first sort of, of, of consistent uh, uh, movement on that front. But did you want to Fellow workers, do you want to come in with anything uh, more on this? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Could you, along the lines of what you're saying, could you give us a little background on what happened to the IWW? Were they destroyed or was it not destroyed? Okay. Um, the. IWW had its first heyday in the great strike wave that swept across the country between about 1911 and 1913. Um, after that, they grew on to have very special strengths really in western timber and agriculture uh, over the course of the years around World War I. But they met with ferocious government repression during the war. Um, and uh, indeed, their entire national convention was arrested and sent to jail uh, in, uh, in 1917. Um, and uh, yeah, a lot of them uh, never got out till the middle of the 1920s. Um, uh, criminal syndicalism laws were passed in, in many Western states, especially. Criminal syndicalism, they called it, yeah. Uh, that meant that to conduct a strike for political purposes was against the law. Hmm? Uh, uh -huh. Well, okay, okay. Uh, so, so strikes for economic purposes supposedly were legal, but uh, a, a, the IWW is charged with political strikes. Um, since they always said the working class and the capitalist class have nothing in common, um, the um, the reason for our existence is not just to win a raise today, uh, but to get rid of capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, and that should be done by direct action. Okay? Um, well, at any rate, they meet with uh, intense uh, repression during the war, but that did not stamp them out. Uh, and here I think there are a lot of histories of the IWW, that it, and almost all of them act as though the end of the story uh, comes in 1917, 1918. Um, but in fact, the highest membership they ever had was 1923. Uh, and uh, at that point, um, waged a very large struggle on the Pacific coast uh, of maritime and dock workers um, with a combination of demands. Uh, one was to win a raise uh, uh, for the workers, and the second was to free class war prisoners. Uh, let all of our fellow workers who were in jail out uh, was, was the demand of the day. The, the federal government had very dramatically released the prominent socialist Eugene Debs from jail and said, that's it. 
And I was, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, go out to Leavenworth, and there's hundreds of people still locked up there. Uh, what about them? I think. Uh, so uh, the demand comes in uh, uh, to uh, free class war prisoners. Um, they were. Um, uh, Upton Sinclair wrote a novel called Oil. Uh, that is the best thing I know on that strike because there were ferocious battles on Liberty Hill in, uh, in Los Angeles uh, in the course of that. Um, well, I don't want to go on all day with, it, with the IWW, but at any rate, that was sort of their high point. Um, they, let me, one final point because it's directly to the question you asked. One of the strongest locals of the IWW in the North was on the Philadelphia waterfront. And on the Philadelphia waterfront, it was not only a racially mixed local, it's the only place I know of uh, in that epoch, or indeed not many of them for a long time afterwards, where you have large numbers of white and black workers in the same organization and the key leadership was all black. Mm -hmm. And you can find the other way around uh, quite a bit. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, everybody involved with, with essentially uh, white leaders. Um, but it's basically black leaders uh, on the Philadelphia waterfront who then welcomed into their ranks large numbers of Poles and Slovaks uh, and Italians um, who also uh, uh, worked on the uh, Philadelphia docks. Uh, it had a strange ending uh, that Local 6 did. Uh, in the end, they're expelled from the IWW uh, and expelled because they faced a problem that all dock workers face. If you want to control conditions on the dock, you've got to control who comes onto the docks. Mm -hmm. Everybody who's out of a job goes down for a day, you know, to the docks. Mm -hmm. The social workers finding somebody who needs help go down to the waterfront uh, for the day. Uh, I see. So people are showing up just for the day all over the place. But if you're a regular, you know, and you're making your living there, uh, it's hard enough to try and get together with other regulars. Who are all these other people uh, you know, that, that are constantly coming around? So finally, the IWW local in Philadelphia uh, says, no, nope. he says, uh, we have a very small uh, admission fee, but you've got to pay it, and you've got to have a card, or else stay the hell away uh, uh, from the docks. And the IWW says, the National, we're open to everybody. What do you mean? You know you're creating something exclusive here. Uh, I see. Uh, just for some workers, and uh, uh, kick them out uh, as as a result. But that's right about the point they do turn down. Um, yeah. There's uh, a book by uh, Anthony Lucas, who's, which has gotten a, a, mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. great deal of publicity. Mm -hmm. uh, the frame up mm -hmm. of Big Bill Haywood. Mm -hmm. uh, forget what it's called, but it's uh, it's being reviewed all over. Yeah. Yeah. What is it called? Anybody? Huh? Big Trouble. Big Trouble. Yeah. Um, the frame-up of the three Western Federation of Miners leaders who played a big role in starting the IWW, um, uh, Haywood, Moyer, and Pettibone. Um, strange book. Um, after having shown how ferocious class war was, vintage 19, 6 and 7 in America, he then says, well, when you come right down to it, I guess they were guilty with no evidence that I can see at all. Uh, but he just sort of, eh, give it to them. Uh, you know, it was a great case, but they were guilty. Uh, so, um, but the book certainly has, has, has got a lot of attention. One, let me just, I can't resist this story, though. The, the, uh, uh, one of the great acts of the IWW in the 1920s, uh, even after their 23 decline. And for the, this loss of this Philadelphia local was crucial to them. Uh, in one of their big strongholds, Lawrence, Massachusetts, they'd, most of the workers had switched to a newer movement that came out of Canada called the One Big Union. Uh, and uh, it had a slightly different spin to it, but it sort of controlled the Lawrence area uh, in the 1920s. Uh, but it took it out of the jurisdiction uh, of the IWW uh, itself. Um, and a lot of the IWW activists uh, went into the New Communist Party uh, in the 1920s. Um, and um, especially among the Finns, who had been a crucial uh, element uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the party itself, in, in the IWW itself. 
So all of these things pulled away membership, but there was one place they still had a great impact. Um, I was warned just a little while ago uh, that uh, to remind you that the CIO did not begin in 1927. Something did happen in 1927, though. Mm. Uh, namely, of course, the execution of Sacco and Vanzetti. Mm. Here, these two Italian anarchists uh, charged with uh, robbing uh, a payroll in South Braintree and killing uh, the payroll clerk um, after years and years and years of protests are sent to the electric chair on the 22nd of August. Well, as that summer of 1927 went on, there were demonstrations and strikes and protests all across America. Mm -hmm. uh, the labor movement was virtually dead, but this issue uh, really uh, galvanized uh, people into activity again. Here in the garment markets of New York, there were gigantic protest demonstrations all across western Pennsylvania. Coal mines were down. And here's where this comes into the IWW. How many ever heard the name of Ludlow? Okay. Ludlow, Colorado, the scene of the bloody massacre of uh, United Mine Workers members uh, in 1914. Yep. Uh, the Rockefeller companies uh, succeeded in defeating the United Mine Workers then. Actually, they didn't wipe them out. It wasn't until 1921 that they really got rid of the United Mine Workers uh, in the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company uh, and made it non-union. The 20... That was United Mine Workers, United... coal miners, coal miners, United Mine Workers of America. Uh, no, people love to think, you know, it's West. It's radical, fighting, must be IWW. Nope, nope, it's the old UMW AFL, uh, right, uh, uh, that, that was involved there. Hmm? Um, but the, um, uh, there's no union at all then, except some kind of a company union uh, thereafter. And as the 22nd of August approaches, I forget just which date it was on, there were uh, six members of the IWW working in those mines. They said, we gotta do something. And they ran out a leaflet saying, strike for Sacco and Vanzetti. The next day, six mines were totally closed down. Hmm? Out on mass. Huh? Italians, Mexicans, Greeks, Bulgarians, whoever, out uh, for Sacco and Vanzetti. Huh? And they, the Wobbly said, said, well, look here. Uh, uh, no. <laughs> no. If we couldn't do all that, let's call them out on strike for a raise. Uh, <laughs> right. It didn't work. Um, so here was, was one important uh, late uh, chapter in the IWW history. The place where the Wobblies retained the most important base among industrial workers into the 1940s was Cleveland, Ohio. And Cleveland actually had a couple of steel mills under IWW shop control uh, in the 1930s until 1948, hmm? uh, after the, the Taft-Hartley Act really uh, put the kibots uh, uh, on them there. Um, and this had a powerful impact on the nature of the CIO in Cleveland. It made it much more radical than it was in a lot of other parts of the country. Because it spoke of industrial unionism, but there was another version of industrial unionism hmm? uh, that was also on the ground. People knew it. People knew it. Uh, and so the, uh, the local Cleveland uh, CIO was sort of uh, pulled in that direction. Um, but uh, yeah, um, for a good long-term history, uh, you may have a better one, but I would start with Fred Thompson, uh, the IWW, its first 75 years. Uh, he's, he's the current. Um, uh, General Secretary. Yeah. That way, up to well, actually, the Cleveland people um, did put some things down on paper. Uh, yeah. They never had any binding contract. They never taken no strike. You know, a pledge that we will not strike during the, the term uh, of this agreement. And it is true that the classic IWW formula was that we uh, did not believe in contracts. We won't extend diplomatic recognition to the bourgeoisie. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's all right. Uh, so, um, this, um, Cleveland at least negotiated with the bourgeoisie. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 
Uh, what does that lead into? Uh, internationalism. Let's stick with that for a while uh, and uh, get some of your thoughts. Um, let, let me throw out a few of my own since um, a questions were asked here about the AFL's uh, foreign policy and uh, uh, about Korea. Um, the American Federation of Labor had a foreign policy that was very hard to distinguish from that of the U.S. government from about World War I on. Uh, prior to that time, uh, there are some important uh, differences. Prior to that time, uh, the AFL was very hostile to militarization generally, uh, to big appropriations to build up the Navy and the Army uh, before World War I. There were a number of AFL unions right down to 1915 and 16 that would not allow a union member to join the National Guard. Mm -hmm. uh, seeing this as, as an enemy force you know, uh, that would be uh, used against it. Um, during the military preparedness campaigns of the Wilson administration in 1916-1917, the bigger unions, like United Mine Workers, which had such a provision, mm -hmm. um, really found themselves on the spot. Uh, and uh, to try and escape from being seen as enemies of the nation and so forth, dropped uh, uh, those uh, provisions, even though there's still an awful lot of uh, opposition in the AFL to the U.S. entry into World War I. Um, popular opposition was enormous uh, around the country as a whole. Um, but um, uh, look, who were the two big ethnic groups of the early AFL? Hmm? Irish and Germans. Hmm? Find Germans enthusiastic about going to fight their uh, cousins? Hmm? Uh -huh. uh, you might have a good conservative German paper like one from Cleveland again that said in 1917 when the U.S. declared war, it is time to put aside protests and demonstration and in the spirit of the suffering Kaiser, hmm, learn to fight for our new homeland. Hmm? How's that? How's that? How's that? One? How's that? One? <laughs> all right. Um, all right. Uh, but at any rate, it's a little hard, really, to sort of throw your back into it uh, when it's happening. And and for the Irish, <laughs> fight for America, fine. But for the British Empire, yeah, right. Um, so. You know, there, there's a big group uh, called the Indianapolis Group because uh, the union headquarters are all in Indianapolis. So they're very, very hostile to getting into the war. Uh, I'm not, of course, socialists openly against it. These are not socialists. They're not socialists. Uh, uh, just worry about that, that war. But, um, Gompers is gung-ho. What President Wilson wants, I want. Uh, so. And really, from that war onward, uh, the two policies were hard to distinguish, except on two points. One, you would understand. The AFL was very enthusiastically friendly to the cause of Irish independence uh, in 1990. There's even a, uh, a movement that uh, a resolution put forward to the 1920 convention, uh, which ultimately was defeated, but it got a lot of support. Uh, for a nationwide boycott on British goods uh, until uh, Ireland uh, is uh, set free. Um, the second uh, one, and one that hit directly to U.S. foreign policy uh, more, was that the early AFL, for all of its support of U.S. policies elsewhere in the world, tended to be rather friendly toward the Mexican Revolution. And um, Gompers, Gompers' great hope was that there would be an, uh, a pan-American federation of labor hmm, headed up by the AFL. All right? And if you want to have a pan-American federation of labor, you've got to start with the country that's the revolutionary leader of the Americas uh, at the time, Mexico. Hmm? Without the Mexican labor movement, forget it. You know, there's no game. There's no game. Hmm? Um, 
Uh, and so uh, the AFL is very much campaigning for recognition of revolutionary Mexico, uh, for coming to terms with it, uh, and so forth in the 1920s. That's sort of the last important point of divergence between U.S. Uh, State Department policy and the AFL uh, that I know of. Um, and uh, certainly from uh, uh, World War II onward, uh, not only did the Federation uh, support uh, the whole Cold War position of the U.S., it generally tended to be even more gung-ho than the State Department was. Uh, and uh, to um, send emissaries uh, around to cultivate sort of anti-communist union leaders in Europe uh, and Japan. You remember the State Department assigned Japan to the CIO and Germany to the AFL hmm? uh, uh, after war. So uh, the um, uh, AFL emissaries play a crucial role in attempting to... Um, it's a tough job. How do you come into a country that's been under Nazi rule since 1913 and find somebody who has no Nazi past and is not a communist? <laughs> you get a rather fine tooth comb uh, uh, out here. Huh? Um, but they did find a number of old socialists and so forth to uh, bring forward uh, and cultivate them then into the uh, leadership of um, this uh, new labor movement. Some of the most... Uh, uh, controversial activities of the AFL was really in Latin America, where the American Institute for Free Labor Development uh, had a rather notorious career. By the 1960s, I think, it's not only communists they saw as an enemy. Uh, you know, you begin to develop all of these left Catholic movements uh, over after sort of the world of the 20th century divides, before and after John the 23rd. Uh, uh, you can sort of you, you open up all kinds of new prospects for social movements after the brief papacy of, of John the Twenty Third, and uh, it shook Latin America, uh, like Quebec, uh, to their foundations. Uh, suddenly, um, a sort of a new left wing is legitimized uh, by you know Pachamenteras and uh, uh, moderate magistrates, these uh, encyclicals. Uh, coming out from Rome. Uh, and in that context, the AFL uh, was uh, there on the battlefront uh, to try and fight back uh, to uh, uh, keep uh, American hegemony. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Hmm? Yeah, go ahead. As, as Argentina? John 23rd is, is a uh, contemporary of John F. Kennedy. Okay. okay. Uh, right, right in there, exactly. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. was, was Louis Bryan one of the people that the CIO Yeah. The yeah. Was, yeah. Uh, and they, uh, the, the State Department preferred the Christian Democrats uh, to Brandt, but here was Brandt. Brandt was sort of ideal for this, a, a socialist who had actually fled Germany in order not to be recruited into the German army. Uh, and so forth, you know, and hidden out in Norway and had ties with the resistance uh, there uh, and so forth. Um, Norway is a good place. Well, that's another subject. Uh, yes. Um, so, um, big question. What's happened since 1995? Maybe some of you know more uh, than I do. But it does seem to me that... Um, I guess people... 19, what happened there? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, in certainly enormous uh, battles within and around the labor movement uh, develop around uh, uh, the war in Vietnam uh, with both the, well, there's no longer both, with the AFL-CIO. Um, as Mike Quill uh, would have said, uh, the CIO had been eaten up by the AFL. Uh, in 1955, um, uh, with a merger uh, that then took place. Uh, Quill, the leader of the Transport Workers Union, was the only CIO leader to oppose uh, that merger. Made, some of you must remember it, his very famous speech. Hmm? We opposed the AFL because it was racist. What's changed? Hmm? We opposed it because it was reactionary and craft-oriented. What's changed? Mm -hmm. We opposed it because we wanted a new social policy. 
I ain't changed. <laughs> it's a great, great speech, but it's, there you go. Um, then anyhow, after the merger in um, uh, 1955, um, I don't want to leave with only that thought in mind, because I was working in New York at the time. Uh, and remember in among the machinists that I associated with uh, how much hope that merger inspired. Uh, the thought that, geez, if we could only all get together, you know, speak the same thing at the same time, we could fix old Eisenhower uh, and, and, and straighten out America. Uh, so Quill cool, was sort of out of step with the rank and file uh, on that. Um, but nevertheless, um, the important thing is this, that the um, uh, the war in Vietnam was one of two crucial events uh, at the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s, in bringing an end to the whole era of governmental policies that we associate with the New Deal. Hmm? Um, the war in Vietnam saw the real breaking up of the kind of political coalitions among American voters uh, that uh, had made uh, that uh, New Deal possible and breaking up in many directions indeed. But the strain was especially great in the um, AFL-CIO because it announced complete support for the war at a time when, first of all, um, quite a number of active trade unionists uh, were vigorously against it. And you get the emergence of the Labor Leadership Assembly for Peace um, as early as 1966 and 67, uh, uh, trying to change uh, the policy of the AFL, finding, trying to find a way to uh, even get the subject uh, talked about. But um, with the uh, uh, new left that then appeared, this was simply the visible, tangible proof that the AFL had simply become another arm of the ruling class. Uh, uh, the war was the worst of all possible things, and here was the American labor movement um, lending its support to it. In my experience... Can you relate, David, the, one of the other subjects that somebody brought up was about the, uh, the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. uh, with regard to the, the international policies, uh, the, the, the appearance of things like the, the Dodge Revolutionary Union Movement and, and other black-led mm -hmm. Uh, independent movements for uh, autonomy and, and black progress, mm -hmm. and if you can extend that going going backward to roles that were the basis for coalition, which that may or may not have been, uh, going back to your reference to the uh, packing house workers and yeah. to the, yeah. the uh, okay. formation of things like the National Negro Labor Committee. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let 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 me peg most of that for a while, but one, one part of it, I don't, I don't want to, you know, dump you folks halfway on this question of the uh, foreign policy, uh, but one part of it is very pertinent. I would recommend to everybody here a book that came out just last year by Penny Von Eschen uh, called Race Against Empire. The gist of that book has been summed up beautifully by her husband, uh, Kevin Gaines, uh, in a title he gave to an article called From Black Power to Civil Rights. Now your question of course implies just the other way around. First comes the civil rights struggles and then comes black power. What's he mean? What's Penny Foundation's book all about? V-O-N-E-S-C-H-E-N. -E what Von Eschen argues is that during World War II, in part out of the struggles around Ethiopia that I was talking about a little while ago, but then with this mobilization of uh, mass struggles for national liberation, among other things, during the war, African-American organizations 
we're very much attracted toward the notion that the struggle for black freedom is a worldwide battle. And it's a battle that is absolutely inseparable from anti-colonialism uh, around the world. And one way this shows up is in the prominence of the figure of George Padmore. Test for you. Who is George Padmore? Padmore. He was the Jamaican labor leader. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The Jamaican labor leader. Jamaican labor leader. One time the most prominent black leader in the Communist International. Hmm? Editor of the Negro Worker. The first paper coming out of the Baku Congress. Hmm? Back there again. It was a paper addressed to black workers all over the world. And starting with the most obvious group of black workers who were all over the world, maritime workers. Hmm? Hmm? Start with those at sea. Hmm? And the black worker is addressed uh, to those on the ships and those on the docks uh, around the whole globe. They stretch from Africa to England to North America, everywhere. Hmm? And Padmore develops among them a sense of um, the central role of peoples of Africa and of African ancestry in world liberation struggles. He stayed with the Communist International until the development of the Popular Front policy, when he broke. He broke. And his argument was very simple and blunt. He said, the International is now calling for collective security by the democracies against the fascist powers. But which ones have colonies? Hmm? 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 <laughs> Germany had none. Italy was trying to get its first hmm? uh, in, in 1935. Huh? No, France, England, Holland, these are the great imperial power uh, no, of the world. Hmm? And it, of course, is crucial to the political dynamics of the period, that U.S. is a force for the status quo hmm? against the fascists who want to rock the boat, change the status quo uh, in, in uh, global diplomacy uh, at that time. Hmm? Um, okay, so here's this Padmore. Wait a minute. What happens hmm? to the colonial world uh, in our vision? Well, as a matter of fact, the story is much more complicated than that, and uh, we won't get into all the, the wrinkles of the thing. But, Padmore, at that point, becomes very, very closely associated with C.L.R. James, uh, who is arguing very much the same thing, that the world revolutionary struggle uh, comes first and foremost uh, from the peoples of color uh, around the world, and they have to be the focal point uh, of struggle. Much as we continue to say that alliance with white workers is important, must be maintained, much as Padmore during the war, most definitely championed fighting to help the Soviet Union against the Nazi invasion. Yeah, no. but nevertheless, where's the focal point? Uh, you know, uh, then argue see. Well, I bring up Padmore because he had weekly columns in the Amsterdam News, in the Chicago Defender, in the Baltimore African American. You know, I'm not talking about left-wing press. Hmm? I'm talking about mass circulation black newspapers. Padmore is there every single week, 1943, 1944, 1945, 1946. And a figure who very much sort of emerges as the of the uh, uh, Pan-African uh, movement. Um, uh, my old neighbor uh, made a Springer Kemp. who was sent as the only black representative in a delegation of American trade unionists going to England in the spring of 1945 uh, to help build you know, wartime collaboration, tells the story of going to her first press conference in England, telling people about how we all have to fight together uh, against the Nazis. Just a black man sitting in the back, listening, listening. When she's done, he says, Come here, daughter. I have some people you should meet. Hmm? They go up to Manchester. Jomo Kenyatta is there. Uh, 
uh, Kwame Nkrumah is there, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? So here are the future prime ministers of, uh, of Africa, uh, um, all uh, sitting around a pub uh, in England. Talk to them a while, uh, uh, says Patmore. Huh? Um, and this indeed becomes uh, the centerpiece of her version. Well, okay. This is George Patmore, and I use him just as an illustration of a, of a kind of... Kind, but, but official NAACP resolutions are talking the language of anti-imperialism uh, in 1945 and 1946. It's that that's turned off by the Cold War. That's what's turned off. By the Cold War, says Von Eschen, civil rights becomes a domestic issue. Hmm? Something in America. Hmm? Something to prove that the United States is really living up to its principles. Hmm? Uh, and this is the way then uh, uh, the cause uh, is to be argued. And Padmore's columns stop in 1947. Stop appearing in the Baltimore African Americans. Stop appearing in the Chicago Defender. Stop appearing in the Amsterdam News. Hmm? And now the orientation is this is a domestic uh, question. Uh, in the context of a world fight uh, between uh, capitalism and communism. Yeah. Where does the impulse for this um, civil rights movement come from? Is it to realize uh, American democracy is it coming from the state? The impulse for civil rights? Yeah. Uh, it's coming, uh, yeah, in 1945-46. That's not at hard, all hard to t tell. Um, first of all, there's been uh, a migration of millions of black Americans into urban centers of the North where they can vote. Hmm? The Democratic Party has to take this into account. Hmm? And it so definitely takes it into account. In, in 1946, Paul Robeson and Walter White together visited President Truman. Yeah, in 46, Paul Robeson and Walter White were buddies. Hmm? Uh, Alan, right? went in to see uh, President Truman and said 46 veterans of the war have been lynched and murdered since Japan surrendered hmm? that was right hmm? what is the federal government going to do about it hmm? and with this pressure the new voting force that's there with the, the sense around the world how do you sum it up? Uh, some of you may have seen uh, in, in the family of man there's a photograph there from Indonesia in 1945 um, with a streetcar uh, going through Jakarta uh, and men, women, children hanging all over it and on the side of it it's written in English all men are created equal. Hmm? All right. uh, meaning what? Meaning, you know, the Japanese Empire has been defeated but damn we're going to let the Dutch Empire come take us once again, hmm? uh, back to power. This, this is uh, the mood that, that it's unfolding around the world. Hmm? And this is something that the Truman administration is very much aware of it. Um, they're aware that I was in the army in, in 1946, and I remember when the big thing we all dreaded in the spring of 46, right after Winston Churchill's speech Hmm? The about, uh, yeah, the Iron Curtain speech in which this is the one that Henry Wallace replies to on how Britain and America must stand together to protect civilization. And all the soldiers I were with said that means they're going to send us to fight for the Dutch Empire. Hmm? Count me out hmm? uh, was uh, uh, the first uh, response that was made. Hmm? But Britain, the British Army had already started bombing in Indonesia uh, uh, the week before Churchill's speech. All right. Okay, so, Indochina. Indonesia, no sir, I'm glad you said that, Indonesia, not Indochina, huh? uh, the French were trying to come back into, into Indochina, uh, yeah, uh, at the same time, um, and so, and, but the Vietnamese, like the Indonesians, said, you know, we're not getting rid of one empire to welcome back another, uh, right, uh, so, um, the State Department knows all of this. No, this, and back the U.S. ultimately figures out, will we be better off, you know, if Indonesia is not Dutch, maybe we can get it, uh, you know, uh, into our sphere. Um, so the ultimate U.S. formula is uh, allow an independent Indonesia provided they kill enough communists, uh, which uh, uh, is the, 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 the 49 uh, formula there. But 
here then was a, uh, a dynamism, a force that gets very much unleashed in the United States. And at the very least, let me say, you're gravely mistaken if you imagine the civil rights struggle as something beginning in mid-1950s uh, in Alabama. The World War I years are, World War II years, are crucially important for the development of the whole demand for fair employment practices, for the demand for an anti-lynching law, which was always uh, the centerpiece of, of the legislation. Yeah. Well, I wanted to just emphasize two things. One, I wanted to just say, um, I remember when my father telling me about the guy who came back from World War One. And being in Europe, and they would feel like human beings were even better than mm -hmm. human beings. Mm -hmm. And they had to come back, and they always find people too, and they walk in the street, and never look them in the eye, and they said, well, enough of that. And then they picked up and then started, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, along the lines of you saying that the civil rights movement became a domestic issue, yeah. um, wasn't that not necessarily the case in every situation? Because um, Malcolm X was going to go to the UN. Mm -hmm. and bring a suit against the United States for violating human rights, not just civil rights. Okay, so yeah. That's pan-Africanism right there. Yeah, okay. All right, uh, two points on this. Uh, and also, of course, some of you may remember the uh, Civil Rights Congress petition to the UN in 1946, hmm? charging the U.S. with genocide. Hmm? Um, and uh, so here again uh, was an appeal coming from inside. Uh, this again is picking up on uh, this post-war wave of lynchings uh, that uh, had uh, uh, swept across the country. What I think is crucial, just to make sure that I get the first question answered first uh, here, is that by 1948, it was clear to the Democratic Party that their future lay with urban America and that there was no way of carrying electoral majority in urban America without black America. Mm -hmm. Without black America. Mm -hmm. So in 1948, the Democrats, for the first time in their history, adopted a civil rights program. Mm -hmm. Out of this visit of Robeson and uh, White, in fact, came the formation, the appointment of a committee uh, to investigate civil rights in America. Mm -hmm. And that committee issued its report uh, early in 1948 uh, that again, on the motions of Hubert Humphrey, becomes part of the democratic platform in 1948. Mm -hmm. For the first time you get, for the first time since the Republicans of the 1860s, mm -hmm. you get a national political party uh, calling for uh, equal employment opportunities, calling for uh, voting rights uh, for African Americans, calling for an end to legal segregation. Of course, the Dixiecrats walk out. They say you betrayed everything the Republican Party, the Democratic Party has historically stood for. And they're right. I mean, they were good historians. Uh, you know, uh, they said, been the party of white. That was the official title in Georgia. You know, white supremacy uh, was, 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 was the... States the, rights. Rights and white. Right. right. Um, so out they go to form the states' rights uh, uh, opposition. Uh, but the fact remains that the Democrats carry the election of 1948 uh, without four southern states uh, that have walked uh, away from them. Also, of course, carry it in the face of the threat from the left uh, that uh, Henry Wallace had represented. But carry it, as all historians of elections will agree, carry it by carrying the cities uh, across the land mm -hmm. uh, and coming out with that coalition that finally comes unstuck in the 1960s. Uh, of all the various people uh, uh, in urban America voting for the Democratic Party. Well, this means then that at the very least strategically, the greatest chance of making some kind of legislative breakthrough and getting government assistance, which is now possible uh, in civil rights struggles, comes from lining up uh, your hopes with the Democrats. And the Democrats at the same time, in the very same convention, have also committed themselves to the Cold War. Mm -hmm. So that through all the black organizations of the country, there runs the battle over foreign policy. You know? Do we support U.S. Uh, in uh, Cold War positions, or uh, do we oppose? Mm -hmm. And it's in that setting that a Padmore comes to be a controversial figure, you know, instead of uh, someone uh, who everybody would want to read, whether you agree with him on everything or not. You, know? uh, you always want to have him there. 
it's in that setting, I think, um, that... Um, anybody here were at the Washington mobilization of 1949? I guess you weren't, because New Yorkers were turned away en masse. You got a good reason to, uh, to, to say you were not there. We Philadelphians got in, uh, in, 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 in that district. All right, here was sort of the first actual march on Washington. You remember one that had been called for in 1941 and then uh, called off. We all know about the 1963 one. What about 1949? 49. Hmm? Then here are all these bills that have been promised. Where's the anti-lynching law? You know, where's the FEPC law? Uh, where are all these things on the platform? None of which has been enacted. You've got a Democratic majority in both houses of Congress. You've got a Democratic president. Well, you know, uh, uh, hmm? It has a familiar ring to it. <laughs> a ring to it. Right. Uh, so here's the cry. So um, this mobilization uh, came from all over the country. is basically for lobbying uh, uh, en masse. So not huge demonstrations in the streets or anything, but huge numbers of lobbyists came down. And at that rally, hmm, the NAACP had people... Oh, well, Herbert Hill uh, was the person in charge of doing the job. Hmm. His job was to screen out people he thought were communists. Uh, from coming in. Communist. Hmm? And two delegations were especially suspect. New York and North Carolina. Hmm? And from those two, they're turned away en masse. They figured, I was with the Philadelphia delegation, that looked sort of, yeah, let them go through. Uh, you know, uh, we, we didn't have, they couldn't watch everybody. Uh, but nevertheless, there's where uh, the attention was concentrated. And then we went before uh, the Democratic leaders of the House and the Senate, who all told us we'd get what we wanted if only we voted communist, and proved ourselves, I mean, but, 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 but a Democrat, and, and, and proved we, we, we were good, good loyal anti-communist. Uh, here, here's sort of a symbol of, of the, the domestication of the issue. You know, it, it's focused in here. Now, you're absolutely right. What happens over the course of the 1960s is that that process gets reversed. There's some beginning of a reversal in uh, 57, 58 with the independence of Ghana. And it's extraordinary how many black intellectuals went to Ghana. Uh, you know, as soon as this black African republic uh, came uh, into existence. Um, there was um, of a number in the thousands mm -hmm. going over to see what was there, help uh, in that struggle, bring uh, the, uh, the message back. Uh, and in Kruma, the uh, new prime minister uh, knew this, knew how to work uh, with his overseas friends very effectively. You all if you don't remember, you should. Uh, Kuma's uh, inaugural address as the first free prime minister of free Ghana. Freedom is declared at one minute after midnight and all is dark in the center of Accra. Huge crowds gathered. Bell strikes 12. Floodlights go on to the top of the governor's house and there is Kwame Nkrumah standing in his prison clothes. Mm -hmm. ah, okay, uh, right. Then last we are. All right. This then becomes sort of the uh, the symbol, you know, uh, for for a new era. Um, but it also means that subsequent to that, although the early civil rights uh, struggles, even many of the most heroic ones, uh, were fought within the ideological parameters that the Cold War uh, allowed. Uh, some of you may have seen the films of, say, the students going into um, Central High School in Little Rock, where the very courageous NAACP leader mobilizing these very courageous youngsters to go. Uh, it's recorded on film. It tells them, remember your part in the war against communism. Mm -hmm. uh, to prove that America... I have never seen that. You were really holding my heart to the I've never mm -hmm. heard this. Mm -hmm. this uh, oh. mm -hmm. um, um, I'm sure she had some more persuasive arguments, but... <laughs> but <also. laughs> 
especially in the context of the Vietnam War. You, you spoke of uh, Malcolm X um, and um, his role, the whole black power movement, again, uh, stressed solidarity of uh, black peoples around the world. And Martin Luther King in the last uh, year and a half or so of his life is very much uh, speaking this language of, of international solidarity. So, you know, a few things in this world uh, change forever. Uh, in one direction or another. My point is that the early Cold War makes this divorce. And then the question is how to break back out of it. And then, as you point out, who breaks and who does not break uh, back out of it uh, in the um, uh, subsequent years. Many Maribos took uh, race, uh, reform, and rebellion starts off with a chapter on the Cold War and, and, the, and, and the alienation between the civil rights struggle and the work of the and the repression of, of, of the communists and the consequences. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this, this I think is something of uh, uh, of uh, crucial importance to us. Um, one last word on the question I started out on. Um, the uh, uh, since the Sweeney administration has come to power in the um, uh, AFL-CIO. Uh, we can sit here and debate for hours now, very fruitful debate on what's changed and what has not changed. Um, but one place that seems to me the most visible, dramatic change is evident is in the foreign policy department. Uh, there was a virtual house cleaning uh, of the old people. You largely had to come through the Social Democrats USA uh, to get in uh, to the foreign policy uh, work of the, uh, the AFL-CIO. Um, and uh, uh, that group was simply fired. Um, in part, of course, now the Cold War was over, so there wasn't the same pressure uh, to make... Uh, Communism, uh, the focal point of uh, the labor movement's foreign policy. But in part also, uh, there was uh, a clear awareness um, among those coming into office that American capital uh, now produced all over the face of the earth. And what went on in workers' movements elsewhere uh, is vital to us. The questions that we were faced with was not simply fighting to see to it that Italians or French and so forth uh, did not adopt communist leadership, but rather if um, there was a strike against Firestone, Bridgestone uh, in both France and the US, uh, there could be some kind of collaboration uh, and coordination here. Now this is something that they're just beginning to feel their way toward. They've had the main thing that's happened is they brought in some remarkable people uh, just to sort of join thinking about this. Uh, there's a, a book that you may have seen by uh, Jeremy Brecker and Tim Costello, uh, Global Village or Global Pillage. Um, uh, it is a, uh, a fascinating little handbook on how to struggle in a globalized economy. Uh, that you might want to look at. They invite Jeremy Brecker to come down to the AFL-CIO headquarters. Well, this is unthinkable, you know, in earlier. Now, I'm, most of this still is on the level of talk and personnel, but nevertheless... That's mm -hmm. sort of as a tag go along these lines, like if they had this conference at Columbia Labor and Electrical Organizing mm -hmm. together mm -hmm. a year ago, mm -hmm. and it's interesting because they was a panel on this whole question of you know, what are they doing internationally, and they had some sort of stand up and talk about ACL and how they relate to ACL now. And 
what they said is basically, well, we want to make these alliances, you know, we want to organize people in these, in these third world countries, how are we going to do that? And what they said is they basically end up using a field people now, but they're basically those people that know on the ground who's who, mm -hmm. and so they feel like they can start divorce them from their old politics and start using them as functionaries. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, well. Uh, yeah. Um, all of this, of course, is very tenuous. In fact, I'd say the whole uh, reform turn in the AFL-CIO is very tenuous. Uh, but nevertheless, it is something important. Uh, I think. Well, uh, that, I, I guess the thing I don't feel advantage in what you said is what what is the necessity for AFL-CIO taking this very Cold War like position. Hmm, okay. Why? Why? How did it benefit them? Its main benefit to them, I think, uh, was um, that of staying out of the line of fire of government repression, uh, which uh, hit those in the labor movement who didn't. Uh, really yeah. 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 War. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, first of all, um, they certainly did not uh, face anything like uh, the attacks that the anti-Cold War unions, you know, line electrical workers, uh, longshoremen, warehousemen, and so forth, uh, faced. Uh, but secondly, one of the great lessons that trade union movements in every imperialist country learned already during World War I um, is that uh, a movement that agrees to uh, side with the patriotic cause of its government um, can actually not only not be attacked by the government but actually encouraged uh, in, in its growth. Um, and when they look back, World War II is the moment when this very clearly happened. Uh, when everybody agrees on no strike pledges and everybody supports the war and so forth. Uh, fact remains, there are government agencies making it very easy to organize. Mm -hmm. The CIO picks up a lot more members during the war than it did in the 1930s. Uh, this is when they sweep through, you know, and, and ranking in uh, the new members. Well, then the question is, can you break with that? Can you go back out on your own? And clearly the leaders of the AFL thought, no, the, the dramatic moment, if you want. I've been coming up with too many dramatic moments to illustrate something, but, but here, here, here to illustrate. 1947, the Taft-Hartley Act is passed. Hmm? Anybody who wants to run for union office has to sign a non-communist affidavit. Immediately afterward, there's a convention of the American Federation of Labor. Has to decide what to do about it. Hmm? And there are two unions that said, we will never have our officers sign non-communist affidavits. I bet you can't remember what the two are. Mine workers. Mine workers? No, wasn't in the AFL. Typographical union. Typographical union. Um, there they have a good reason. Typographical union said, we were here long before any of these other people were even born. You know, we go to the 1850s. What do you mean we got to take an oath that we're not communists or something? Oh, damn! If, if we're going to do any, any such thing, uh, you know, um, we invented trade unionism. Uh, you know, uh, and and moreover, who needs an NLRB anyhow? Uh, you know, uh, every every printer goes by the book, uh, and, and and that's that. Huh? And uh, with the United Mine Workers, they now at the peak of their strength. Hmm? And John L. Lewis, of course, says uh, that we're better off without government. If we can't use the NLRB, who needs it? Who needs it? And he gets up at the 1947 AFL convention and makes this thunderous address to that effect. Hmm. Who follows him to the platform? Chairman of New York and the Secretary of Treasury, George Meany. This is the making of his fame. Hmm. George Meany gets up and says, I don't know what kind of a world John L. Lewis is living in. But we all know darn well that there's no way for a union movement to survive when it defies the government. Mm -hmm. And maybe you guys and the mine workers think you can pull it off. Mm -hmm. But the rest of us will be eaten alive, says he. He said there's no choice but to sign it. And furthermore, I have no hesitation in saying I never was a communist, I never was a comrade. And he looks at John L. Lewis and says, and I never was a comrade of the comrades. Hmm? Uh, carries the day, the vote's overwhelmingly AFL going to sign. Uh, 
uh, the uh, non-communist affidavits, use this governmental machinery. I think that's the crucial thing, uh, which uh, they see as so crucial to them. Um, so yes, to fix yourself into a certain niche in society, uh, rather than uh, being uh, this opposition movement, I think was uh, the crucial thing. The um, other movements. I can remember going to rallies in Italy in the 1970s and seeing always on the platform somebody from Chile, hmm? somebody from South Africa, you know, uh, somebody from Vietnam. Uh, this was just, you'd expect it uh, when you went out uh, to a workers' meeting uh, that this was going to be uh, part of the discourse uh, that uh, then went on. And that certainly has not been uh, the legacy with which most of us have grown up uh, uh, here in uh, the United States. Um, it's also crucial to keep in mind that the most effective working class movements that come to my mind developing since 1970 uh, around the world or exercising their power uh, since 1970 have all been outside of the old industrial uh, heartland of Europe and North America. The three most obvious are South Africa, Brazil, and South Korea. And in some respects, um, uh, South Korea uh, is especially noteworthy, one claim to fame they have, the only workers in the entire world who have ever organized international business machines. Mm. Nobody in Europe, nobody in North America has ever broken through IBM. Mm. In Seoul they did. Uh, you know. um, but here has developed a movement that we'd have to look at closely because its whole ideological character is very different uh, from uh, what it is that we're familiar with, our notion of what's right-wing language, left-wing language, and so forth, um, uh, is not theirs, but that has demonstrated e enormous militancy. Um, taking advantage of the fact, I think, that industrial development in South Korea has tended to be concentrated in the hands of a handful of enormous companies that make, you know, Hyundai makes ships, you know, refrigerators, automobiles, uh, you name it, uh, all under one conglomerate roof. And also the workers are literally under that roof. The housing is all company uh, housing, you know, the apartment complexes and so forth. Uh, just this total concentration of personnel that one find there. Put that together with a ferociously repressive state. Um, that has agreed, like most of the so-called Pacific Tigers, uh, all of them, in fact, have agreed, that the key to economic development is low wages. And the crucial thing to continue and maintain growth 
is to keep your thumb on the workers, uh, to see to it that they don't develop appetites uh, that are too big. And therefore, we want to encourage every kind of freedom of economic activity while the workers keep their yaps shut uh, and go to the jobs and do what they are told. Um, well, that hasn't been the mood of the South Korean workers. And uh, in recent years, of course, there's just been strike after strike after strike after strike. Um, the uh, uh, Kim Dae-jung, who now to the horror of the business pages is in a position to be possibly the next president, um, has been to all of his life associated with the working class movement uh, in uh, uh, South Korea. This is why everything was mobilized against him in the, in the last uh, election. Um, the, um, you know, his policies uh, and often would look quite strange to us, but there's no question where his base is uh, and uh, what kind of a movement uh, that he uh, reflects there. So that uh, here we have a context in which um, uh, workers' movements have been developing there in South Africa, of course, where the trade unions played such a crucial role in the, in the whole liberation struggle. In Brazil, Brazil, Brazil. Uh, uh, E.J. Hobsbawm once had the indisputable proposition that every labor party in the world appeared between 1880 and 1920. If he didn't make it in that gap, it was too late. He hadn't heard of Brazil. Uh, yeah, uh, the Brazilian one comes on uh, in the 1970s uh, and becomes a major contender for national power, uh, emerging um, not only out of the industrial areas, of course, much of the... Um, uh, the most revolutionary struggle going on in Brazil now has gone back to the land again uh, as its focal point among rural uh, workers uh, in that country. Uh, but nevertheless, in, in each of these cases, uh, we've had this uh, very dramatic demonstration of the fact that um, uh, we're a long way from the world of the Second International, where I gave, began my lecture this afternoon. You know, where sort of labor movements are associated with Europe and uh, the rest of the world tags on uh, uh, somehow or other. Um, uh, that is very clearly uh, not uh, the world that we're faced with. And the question is what kinds of alliances, you know, what kind of mutual support can develop. A few people in the U.S., largely in the UAW, uh, came up with the idea of, sort of organizing branches of U.S. unions in Mexico uh, and elsewhere that struck me as one of the worst ideas I'd heard in many a year. Um, and apparently, they ultimately came to agree. Um, that every country has its own traditions, its own way of doing things, its own style of unions, its own laws. And I think we're going to take things that have developed out of peculiar US experience and say, ah, here's the right way. Uh, you know, uh, come with us. No. But what I do admire. Uh, is the uh, approach that uh, the United Electrical Workers uh, have developed. Of, and in jointly with the Teamsters, by the way, uh, in the Maquiladora areas, of um, making common cause with uh, workers' organizations that the Mexicans themselves have created, mm? and particularly the so-called autonomous unions, uh, the ones that are not directly under uh, the administration of the, of the state. Um, and finding ways in which uh, uh, U.S. workers can throw their support to struggles in Mexico and vice versa. The U.E. already had a wonderful payoff in, um, in Milwaukee uh, when they're engaged in an organizing drive and found um, uh, a very large portion of the workers, close to half, were immigrants from Mexico. And uh, they were rather suspicious of U.S. unions, uh, as you would expect. So the UE just called up their friends from the Maquiladoras and said, hey, come on up, give us a hand. Hmm? And uh, they came hmm? uh, and talked about what we've been doing together in Mexico, what we can do together in Milwaukee. Boom, they win uh, uh, NLRB election uh, uh, right off the bat uh, uh, coming out of this. Um, but this, this is not trying to put everybody under the same umbrella. You know, this is not trying to put them all in the same organization. Each one has their own way, uh, uh, but nevertheless finding ways to uh, lend support is crucial. Uh, certainly no U.S. union could have organized IBM in Seoul. 
uh, you know, uh, that had to be a South Korean organization. Uh, that would do, that. do you think the impact of the current uh, international monetary funds to South Korea and bail out the union obviously yeah. Yeah. be the ones that yeah. uh, attempt to put it on, on their neck? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, uh, there are already uh, big demonstrations going on uh, across South Korea uh, uh, before the measures have even been put into the legislature because everybody knows uh, uh, what this is going to mean. Um, uh, clearly, the uh, um, International Monetary Fund has been telling the Korean government um, that you've really got to crack down, cut out... Um, uh, welfare expenditures, get rid of, one thing that always horrifies the uh, International Monetary Fund is the idea that anybody has a right to a job. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, all right. I don't know. get rid of that, uh, you know, uh, to give management flexibility uh, to uh, sack people uh, and uh, reshape everything. Um, and there indeed, uh, I think we're going to see a major confrontation for the future because this is exactly why, as I said earlier on, the term overproduction is showing up in the business pages of the uh, American newspapers in the 1990s with the same frequency as it did in the 1890s. Hmm? And the question then, uh, what does it all mean? Because what generally in business circles they're afraid of um, is that... Uh, with a real economic disaster in Thailand, in Indonesia, um, in uh, South Korea, who knows? Hong Kong is trembling uh, uh, at this point. Um, here you have economies that have already followed the IBM and US formula in one important way. It now sounds like a voice out of the past to remember import substitution policies. Hmm? In the 1960s and 70s, this is what virtually every country around the third world strove for, to put an end to being suppliers of raw material uh, to the advanced industrial countries hmm, and develop their own domestic markets. Uh, the, most, the most thorough creative formula was that of the... Uh, uh, popular unity government in Chile. Mm -hmm. uh, a massive increase in the minimum wage, uh, you remember, to make customers for Chilean goods. Um, a conversion of capital away from exports uh, into uh, what's needed for our people. Well, uh, and other places, often called African socialism, Arab socialism, really was just, um, you know, policies aiming at domestic uh, markets uh, uh, rather than foreign. Socialism is an exaggeration in all these cases, uh, to say the least. Um, but that world is in the past. And indeed, the prevailing wor uh, mood in government throughout the third world for a good long while now has been that that, say, Enrique Cardoso's regime in, uh, in Brazil uh, illustrates so dramatically, um, that um, there's only a limited amount of capital flying around the world we got to grab some of it. Hmm? And if we were to grab some of it, we need to set up policies that will be attractive uh, to those investors. Hmm? Uh, and that becomes the key uh, to domestic policy. That, to my mind, was what NAFTA was all about. NAFTA didn't change any policies in Mexico. Mexico had already changed its policy to an open free trade, open uh, investment regime. NAFTA now makes it illegal to change back. Hmm? Say, hey, we made a mistake. You know, we slit our own throats. Hmm? Now you're in violation of international treaty obligations to reverse course uh, and uh, attempt something else. And that, it seems to me, is, is the key uh, uh, to the NAFTA question. And this is crucial to this question of overproduction right now. Hmm? A cheering section, don't worry about it. <laughs> it's, 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 it's crucial to the question of overproduction right now hmm? because Given the fact that the great output of Indonesia, of South Korea, yes, of China, 
has come to be oriented first and foremost towards selling in the United States and in Western Europe hmm? uh, the products that are made there, either selling directly on their under their own names or more often selling, uh, you know, to a branch plant of the U.S. over there make something uh, for the headquarters company. We can't boycott it because there's nothing else to buy. Okay. But in that setting, there are more and more. <laughs> in that setting, if they are under a really severe financial uh, squeeze and facing a real economic crisis. The only possible way to stay afloat is to make a desperate battle to increase exports, keep them alive, make them still cheaper, grind their own people down further and further and further uh, to get those goods sold. And in this context, your point really comes home to roost. Hmm? because this means that the ultimate dumping ground for everything has got to be here. And then the question is, where do domestic producers sell uh, uh, in uh, the United States itself? And I think what, we, what is being feared in the business world, and I can understand it, uh, is a, a kind of new acceleration principle hmm, of a crisis that just rolls in uh, from uh, other parts of the world uh, to the most industrialized countries themselves. Yes, the great imperial powers has succeeded in making all the world their bailiwick, and therefore the crisis can start in any part of the bailiwick. Uh, it's all one economy uh, now. Um, and indeed, as early as three years ago, there was a um, meeting of leading bankers of the world in Dravos, Switzerland. Uh, I happened to be living in Holland at the time, so I was reading about this stuff every day. I don't know how much of it got reported here. Uh, but, but the main subject of the conference was how do we create firewalls in a world economy? Hmm? How do we keep a crisis in one place from destroying every place? Huh? We have succeeded too well no. in leveling the entire uh, playing field. Um, now, uh, how do we keep from being devoured uh, by what it is? These were bankers, you know, uh, meeting in Dravos, um, uh, raising that concern and uh, the concern. So that today, I don't know how much the name of Jeffrey Sachs means to any of you. Uh, a Harvard economist, uh, then uh, right, uh, a key financial advisor to Pinochet in Chile, right how to destroy all of the socialist world that had been created there in Chile uh, and open up everything to free market economics. Then he went over to tell Yeltsin how to do it and he's just been all over the world, you know. Uh, let it go. I don't know if any of you saw. This may have been misreported, but he was reported in the New York Times business section as having said, the IMF is going too far in South Korea. Hmm? Uh, they're overdoing it. If Jeffrey Sachs thinks they're overdoing it, my God. Uh, well, I don't know where this, this, this leaves me. Hmm? Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think they have to 
to distinguish uh, a bit more uh, pointedly between the, the industrial is and part of that and the capitalism <coughs> part of that. Um, because uh, as, as, as early as, uh, as the manifesto, which was uh, 150 years ago, Marx said that the great accomplishment of, of capitalism was to create a world market, this kind of integrated production, distribution, change, um, a currency kind of flow. But with it comes the contradictions that are so, so uh, very severe and so evident today. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, yeah. yeah. You're honest? The problem is uh, that Marx is a dependent on classic economic development. So that if you try and reconceptualize the equitable distribution of income or across the world, which is one of the things you're aiming to put to us, there's nobody home. And then I also wanted to remind you that in a thousand years, it's only been about 10 or 12 great stars, but it's only bad for the third and the third man. There are a lot of people who think of the categories like books and you know, talking about social policy, but they reinvent the whole economic scheme by which both survival at, across the world and some amount of the necessary money for, you know, um, I'm not sure what we're supposed to conclude from that. Hmm? Yes, okay. <laughs> but let, let me, yeah. Well, oh, well, let me just say one one thing on on this this general question that uh, sister brought up here. Um, it does seem to me that one of the biggest challenges that all of us face right now is that of reopening our imagination. And this is something that can be faced only collectively. I don't think there's any one great man or one great woman that's going to sit down and come up with the answer you know, uh, to the world that, that we face. But that there is a need to break out of a mindset that especially since 1970 it's become narrower and narrower and narrower notion that there's only one realistic possibility hmm? uh, and that is profit making systems and uh, market exchange uh, alas um, even uh, the great manly from Jamaica uh, just before his death I got this quote out of his obituary uh, recanted his earlier struggles for socialism saying I kept thinking you could make the world submit to a system of political management to safeguard against injustice and inequity I did not realize that the forces of production are too powerful, their inherent logic too irresistible to be made subservient to political barriers on a permanent basis. And here is sort of the ultimate argument for free trade globalism. I, I give up. I surrender. Uh, that, that's the only thing that's possible. Um, and I think what... permanent basis we're all dead. Okay, on a permanent basis we're all Right. Uh, but I think what has been made evident in a lot of these recent remarks uh, is that that kind of intellectual surrender uh, puts us in exactly the trap that Karl Polanyi said was the heart of the problem in the 1890s. You remember that a system with nothing but a free market to control it will destroy its social and its natural substance. Hmm? And the question on is how we think about both hmm? uh, in beginning to devise ways of coming to grips with this world. Those of us who were around in the 1940s sort of saw the, the last age in which something other than that was thinkable uh, in the United States. Um, I think especially, uh, if you want to read something almost as short as uh, Marx's famous statement in the contribution to the critique of political economy, you know, which we see quoted so much that we're astonished when we learn it's only one page long, uh, you know, uh, to pick the thing up. Well, another one page reading uh, for you, uh, is in a book by Norbert Wiener, W-I-E-N-E-R, the mathematician who invented c cybernetics. Hmm? The book is called Cybernetics, written in 1947. It's all mathematics, but the introduction is in English. Hmm? <laughs> and in that introduction, 
Wiener says that he and his colleagues have provided the intellectual basis for an entirely new form of economic life. He said, just as the first industrial revolution may be, the first industrial revolution may be imagined as a devaluation of the human arm, there is no wage at which a pick and shovel operator can work that can compete with a drag line. You just cannot get cheap enough and be alive. So, so too, the second industrial revolution may be considered that of cybernetics, a devaluation of the human brain. As it become intellectual processes, which have now become the heart of electronic devices that my friends and I have been inventing. Then, now, it's true that there were some occupations that survived the first industrial revolution. Certain skills that were needed went on. And he says some will survive the second. But the average human being, the person of mediocre attainments or less, will have nothing to sell that will be worth anyone's money to buy. Next paragraph. The answer, of course, is to organize society on some basis other than buying and selling. Well, to imagine that this could, this is ordinary discourse in 1946, 1947. Hmm? An unthinkable world. How do you organize society on some basis other than buying and selling? Hmm? Think. Think. Think and act. This becomes, I think, the crucial need for the moment. A couple more, then I'm running out. Go. Yeah, I just wanted to bring this back to the situation of labor movement now. Mm -hmm. Just kind of look at the whole scope of the U.S. flow, the U.S. and the U.S. and the development of kind of opportunities in terms of um, supporting the U.S. and the U.S. and the And so I just wondered what you thought, you know, you started talking to changes in the NFL and how tenuous they were, and someone had asked about the impact against the teams that have been carrying. I just wondered, what do you see, how much do you see the possibility for change and development of the labor movement, not just the strong labor movement, economically, but the political movement as a whole? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think that's a good question. Um, and I think that's a good question. 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 I think that's a the ideological and basis for that kind of math role. This is something I think uh, that we all need to be thinking about very carefully uh, and a lot. Um, I was lucky to spend yesterday um, a little further downtown uh, in a discussion with rank-and-file activists from around the country on a, exactly this question. What, what was their reading you know, of uh, uh, what's going on uh, in America today and what's possible? Most of them were from the Teamsters uh, and from the, the most successful rank-and-file movement this country's developed in Lord knows how long, you know, the, the Teamsters for a Democratic Union. Uh, but not everybody uh, was uh, from that uh, same background. Um, but um, to say the least, the mood was a cautious one. Uh, you speak of one step forward, two steps back, uh, why, uh, it was all around us uh, uh, that we could see today. There were certainly some indications of a possibilities for very new forms of mobilization, and maybe one of the one things that everybody there agreed on. Um, uh, somebody came up with a marvelous phrase, secondary forms of activity. What do you mean? Hmm? While all this action is going on in the unions and has to go on in the unions, we always must need to focus attention also on what kinds of mobilization take place outside of formal union structures that can in turn have an important impact on the way unions themselves uh, conduct themselves. Some of these are obvious. Some of you are involved in them. Organizations like Justice, uh, you know, Jobs with Justice, uh, and so forth, appearing around the country, that does things that a union could not possibly do because no union central labor council can have 
ministers of the gospel, you know, leaders of community organizations, that well, you've got to be a delegate from your job, you know. <laughs> Rightly so, a union's a union, right? Uh, but nevertheless, a union is not enough, you know, uh, to uh, bring together uh, all of these different forms of people who can then create a kind of atmosphere, locally, regionally, nationally, um, that opens up new possibilities uh, for what there is that a, a union can and cannot do. I see the Labor Party in this connection. Uh, I've been uh, working with it in Connecticut uh, while I've been there and have found um, very exciting. We, we picked out the, the town of Meriden. And we got a Meriden person here, right? <laughs> okay, from Meriden, right. Uh, I don't know if anybody's knocked on your door to sign a petition for the 28th Amendment. Give me your address. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh, the, the proposed 28th Amendment, of course, is an amendment to the Constitution guaranteeing the basic purpose of uh, American government is to give everyone a job with a livable income. Hmm? That should be the point of departure of economic policy. Right? The response has been as enthusiastic as it can possibly be until you start moving up the hill to some of the fancier uh, 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 homes uh, in Maryland. Right, uh, right, right. <laughs> right. Uh, I know, there's fancy people outside of Maryland. Okay, <laughs> right, right. Um, and, um, you know, the, the Labor Party has set up this formula. You're supposed to get 10% of the voters in a voting district uh, to sign. We got our 10%. Uh, uh, very systematic work. It took, uh, but it was just door to door, door to door, door to front people. And now around to the next step of trying to form a ward club, um, which can totally change the whole nature of the Labor Party. Uh, once you have a ward club, then what are we going to do? Huh? Uh, you know, what's your problem? Who do you want to run? Uh, uh, this, this kind of uh, basis for me. But this, again, has been basically involved in trying to create a... I'll get postmodern again. Create a different domain for discourse. Hmm? That you can talk about subjects. Uh, that, uh, that Manley just told us were impossible to think about uh, anymore, uh, you know, uh, and make them part of uh, the activities of the labor movement itself. So that it seems to me that crucial as, uh, there, there have been crucial new developments uh, within the trade unions, um, but in one sense, uh, equal, maybe even more important, uh, are some of these uh, domains of mobilization among working people uh, that work in conjunction with the unions very often, but uh, parallel to them. I think this is this kind of struggle is what's made it possible to get a uh, a leadership in the AFL-CIO that at least has begun thinking uh, in new ways. Um, it is still very much a leadership that wants to take old styles of uh, organization by paid officials and so forth and just put more energy into it. Hmm? Um, and uh, very clearly that's a long way from what the uh, Teamsters for a Democratic Union did. Uh, they, uh, I mean, after all, Teamsters for a Democratic Union, 17 years old now, hmm? in their early days, you know, anybody who got up and spoke on their behalf uh, at any kind of Teamsters convention, was beaten to a bloody pulp on the spot. I can remember a rank-and-file UPS strike when I was in Pittsburgh where the union sent down goons to break the picket line. Uh, that's all in the memory. That's all in the origins uh, of uh, uh, this movement uh, that developed. But this means that while they were able to open up enough in the Teamsters to allow a, um, a new president with new ways of thinking and organizing to come in, they also kept themselves distinct and independent even after Kerry was in office. Hmm? And this, I think, was vitally important. Hmm? Important because on the one side, the Kerry leadership showed us how a successful union struggle can be organized today. And that United Parcel Service strike was a masterpiece. And you don't get many good ones nowadays, you know. I mean, uh, come, come right back down to it. I mean, and especially when you remember that from day one, 
the company was bringing workers into meetings for team uh, discussions and so forth, how we're all in the same boat together, uh, while the union is organizing itself for a confrontation. And they could finally get into the negotiations where uh, in the final hours in Washington, uh, the company uh, brought forward a teamwork proposal to put into the Constitution. And Kerry just said, burn it. Um, and that was the end of it. Absolutely the end of it. Now, it was the end of it only because you know, there were hundreds of thousands of workers uh, who had already decided that, uh, that uh, that's what they were going to do. Um, and that they were going to um, win, this is what, of course, made it so dramatic, win on a struggle that resonated all throughout America. Hmm? The part-timer. Hmm? The part-timer. How about a future, you know, uh, for somebody uh, on a job? And here they were ready to take it on and make a substantial victory uh, on that. Um, well, it's, in one sense, of course, the company outsmarted itself. Uh, they, they had always, I don't know if any of you work for UPS, right? They had always, you know, sort of whipped everybody into line, smile to the customer, be on time, uh, be sweet and good. Uh, so when they went out on strike, the customers all said, geez, that's the nicest man or woman I ever saw, you know. Uh, they, they, they must be right. Uh, and so and, 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 uh, uh, help uh, win that kind of support. Hmm? Um, but um, the fact remains that here was, you know, uh, a big one. Um, and it just galvanized the movement. And, of course, we get kicked in the stomach the very next day. So why can't we have a viable labor party in this country? I don't quite understand why the union kind of viable. We only have 20 more minutes. We've got less than that. I've got to go in five more minutes. Uh, well, I'll be come back in just a minute. Yeah. Senator Sarah Lawrence. <laughs> 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 okay. Thank you. 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 Th
if you want your hair fixed, <laughs> you know, come to me. Huh? Uh, but, but nevertheless, I mean, this, this, is, this is the response, you know, uh, uh, all around uh, uh, the place. See? Um, so here, in a sense, we're just opening up something that, that seems absolutely outrageous from free market principles, but to ordinary people is common sense. You know? so, so the first thing is sort of to find um, uh, where those questions lie. And, and the second thing, I think, um, is that around the land, I found much, much less talk about unions as corrupt uh, and so forth after the UPS strike than before. And that's precisely why the indictment of Kerry and company is such a menace to us all. Uh, that's a really a one step forward, two steps back one. Because uh, not just going to be Kerry. There are going to be eight, ten very prominent people uh, brought up on trial uh, in the near future. Um, and one of the big things that we were talking about here was how we got in to that situation to begin with. And one thing the TDU people all agreed on um, is that they had been shut out in one very important process. That they helped elect a new administration that went down to office and to Washington and immediately started playing by Washington's rules. Mm -hmm. Went to Clinton to figure out how to get advisors, got focus groups. Mm -hmm. You never had focus groups. They talked to everybody, uh, you know, uh, around the place. Mm -hmm. uh, got consultants uh, that cost money. Mm -hmm. And therefore, all the money had to be brought up from someplace to get this. Mm -hmm. And uh, the basic uh, belief of these, you know, uh, uh, Ken Paff and Steve Early and these TU, we should never have been doing that whole thing. That whole game is the enemy's game. Hmm? Uh, and we got to play uh, in another way. Right? Um, and, um, but nevertheless, it now has to be played against the backdrop of, uh, you know, a big mud pie in our face just as we thought we were getting someplace. You know? Uh, let's see. Yeah. Um, well, no, he's been he's been waiting for a long time. <laughs> he's been waiting for a long time. Why I'm asking you Yep, yep. I've been following the A and the position. Yep. Are they working? Mm hmm Yes. And how many other people like that? Mm hmm so the whole thing of who is a worker really is changing. It is. It is. It is. Uh, yeah. Do you, yeah. What do you, how yeah. do you... Uh, yeah. Ask a doctor. Ask a doctor. Okay. Yeah. Um, clearly when, when, when I think about workers, I think of uh, people um, dependent on wages for a living. Hmm? Um, but that's become most of the population today. Hmm? Uh, we're virtually all either employees or unemployed uh, you know, uh, around the land as a whole. Some paid a hell of a lot better than others, you know, uh, but nevertheless, uh, all there. Um, it's noteworthy, and you've got to uh, think about it in terms of mobilizations, that very often the most successful, durable organizations have come from people who are relatively better off uh, among working people. Uh, you know, in fact, this was the old anarchist complaint against unions. Uh, they help the best off workers. What about you know, uh, the worst off uh, workers uh, uh, that need it the most? Um, but I think what is important to your question today is that while on the one hand, the world of producers of basic goods in manufacturing has not at all disappeared. Not at all disappeared. I think that uh, it's just wiped off the face of the earth. It's a great mistake. It's been spread around the earth. There's still an awful lot here in the United States. It's still an important manufacturing country. And we can't just, you know, neglect that world. But at the same time, ever since the economic crisis of 1970, 71, 72, it's been clear a crisis because the question that emerged in the mind of capital then is, where can we find new avenues for profitable investment? Hmm? In part, it's around the world, and in part, it's in the world of services, in the world of finance, in the world of merchandising, and the world of education. Hmm? Big bucks um, lie here. Hmm? And indeed, with 
the money pouring into those areas, so the number of workers. There's a great article that, that the economist Emma Rothschild did in the New York Review of Books about 1981 called Reagan in the New America, in which she pointed out that as early as 1981, the number of new employees in fast food in the United States, she says, in the last 10 years, the number of new employees in fast food is greater than the combined total of steel workers and auto workers in the United States of America. Or to put it another way, if you can imagine the entire labor force of Canada moving to the United States and going to work for McDonald's and Arby's, hmm? that's the new shift uh, uh, that has uh, taken place. So clearly, we're no longer just thinking about General Motors and Ford uh, uh, when we're thinking about working. But secondly, education employs about two and a half million people now around the country. Hmm? Teachers, staff, both. Hmm? Hmm? This has also been, there, there's a new book out that some of you may have seen. I contributed an introduction to it. Uh, it often goes under the name of Noam Chomsky, though, because the authors are just listed alphabetically. C comes before M, alas. Uh, uh, but it's called The Cold War in the University. There's a great piece in there on the economics of the modern university uh, by a man named Richard Lewontin. Hmm? On the, way, on the way it is that, indeed, the Cold War created overnight an explosion of higher education and academic research and development uh, in the United States. You know, college in 1940 was something for about a million people uh, in, in the United States uh, to experience, a very, very rare experience. Now. Half of the eligible population is in some form of higher education uh, around the country. Well, that had reached its peak uh, about the beginning of the 1990s. Hmm? And a real squeeze is on in that domain. And as that squeeze is on, of course, important things have happened that help indicate why it is that so much of the current organization of workers, so many of the people who now think of who's a worker, hmm? um, appears precisely in the academic world. There's a wonderful piece in the Chronicle of Higher Education uh, about two weeks ago by a Texas uh, oil executive who is a trustee of the University of Texas, uh, giving, saying, universities must learn from business how to run an establishment. And the first thing you learn from modern business is to get rid of all activities except your core activities. Farm them out, hmm? subcontract, hmm? everything except the teaching. Uh, around uh, the university. And secondly, with the teaching, yeah, you can farm some of that out, but best of all, you casualize that. Hmm? You casualize that. Here is the domain for casual labor. And so you begin to get, there's a big movement among uh, teaching assistants where I teach uh, to form a union. They got an NLRB election probably coming up this winter uh, on this. Hmm? Um, but when you hear them talk, one of the things that most concerns them is not simply that they are such an important part of the teaching staff and ignored and underpaid while doing it, but the prospect that when they graduate, what they get paid will be even less. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. Um, a pickup job here, a pickup job there, a pickup job someplace else. Hmm? Uh, okay. um, so the question then is, um, here in uh, the domain of education, just as in the world of McDonald's, uh, just as in the world of uh, General Motors, uh, we're facing this attempt really to recreate one aspect of the 19th century, uh, that in which everybody's job is casual. Hmm? You're in, you're out, you're in, you're out. Uh, and certainly you don't think like those South Koreans that you've got a right you know, uh, uh, to the job uh, that, that you were hired for. Um, so in this context, it's understandable that all kinds of people that never thought that they were workers uh, in an earlier epoch, uh, are now uh, thinking in this way. Okay. Well, I want to thank Principal David and thank all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.